2. It's a continuation of where we left off last week. <clears throat> Hebrews 13. Let's pray together and let's get into this. <clears throat> Heavenly Father, I just want to pray, Lord God, that you would please calm all hearts right now. Lord, I know that a number of us have been running around trying to get things done and, and Lord, me especially, I am the chief among those and I just want to pray that my own heart right now could just be calm. Lord, we are here for you. We are here to bring glory to your name. And Father, I ask that through the proclamation of your word, through the teaching of the truth of scripture, that you would be glorified today. Father, that you would cause our hearts to change, to bend to your will. Lord, unite our hearts to fear your name. You're not, unite our hearts, Lord, to be obedient to you. Unite our hearts to love you. And Lord, as we are united to you, may that cause us to be united one to another. As we discuss <clears throat> the subject today of brotherly love, Lord, please minister to our hearts today. Change our hearts, God. Change our minds. And work in us both to will and to do of your good pleasure. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Verse 1. We're going to read just verse 1 for, for right now. <clears throat> verse 1. <clears throat> Let love of the brethren continue. Very simple phrase, quick and to the point. Now, of course, our coverage of this hasn't exactly been quick and to the point because there's a lot to think about here. But the message is actually very simplistic. Let love of the brethren continue continue. Now, if for some reason you've not listened to last week's message, I want to encourage you to do that. I'm not going to do much of a, re of a review. Suffice it to say that in closing last week, I pointed out that the subject of brotherly love and the importance of brotherly love is something that's stressed throughout the New Testament. Remember that brotherly love Philadelphia, remember that Greek word, <clears throat> is a distinct, is distinctly a love that is shared and expressed between Christians. It is a love that exists between people because of their union to God through Christ. That's what it is. The exhortation here is for the believers of this community to maintain this love. This kind of love is unique to the Christian church. It is not a love that the unsaved can even partake of or engage in. And we'll get into that a little bit more later on. Now, the scriptures teach there, there are at least three reasons for why Brotherly love is so important. There may actually be more reasons than three, but the three that we're going to focus on are very clear in the scriptures. So that's what I said last week. That's what we were going to cover to begin today. So let's talk about why brotherly love is so important. Why is brotherly love so important? Number one, because it reveals to the world that we belong to Jesus Christ. It reveals to the world that we belong to Jesus Christ. Now, maybe we don't think that's that big of a deal. But I want us to understand that this was first made clear by Jesus Christ himself when he said this. John 13, 34. You can turn there real quick if you want, but I'm just going to read, read it to you. <clears throat> he said, a new commandment I give to you, that you love one another 
even as I have loved you, that you also love one another. And by this, here's the, the punch punchline. By this, all men will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. Now that's what Jesus taught. So in effect, God has given the world a right to evaluate us on the basis of our love for each other as a witness to the world and as a testimony for our Lord, it is of the greatest importance that we genuinely consider ourselves or rather consider others better than ourselves. That we look out for the interests of others more than our own interests. As it says in Philippians chapter two, I quoted that to you last week. Brotherly love must continue because one of the reasons being it reveals to the world that we belong to Jesus Christ. And so when we are exercising brotherly love, our lives end up preaching a very powerful sermon, a very eloquent sermon to the world around us. Jesus also said in John 17, 21, in what we call the high priestly prayer, Jesus said that they may all be one even as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they also may be in us so that the world may believe that you sent me. Then there's this other verse in 1 Peter 2.12. It says this, keep your behavior excellent among the Gentiles so that in the thing in which they slander you as evildoers, they may, because of your good deeds, as they observe them, glorify God in the day of visitation. So there is the concept here of our love for each other is a demonstration of love to the world that they can't experience the way we do. Now, I want to offer one caveat, 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 <clears throat> to help our understanding of this. Having said everything I just said, we need to keep in mind that this does not mean that when Christians demonstrate biblical love within their ranks, that this is going to appease the world. It does not mean that they're all going to like us more. Why? Well, because Christian love is defined by Scripture. And the unsaved world will not always be agreeable to a biblical standard of love. But that's the only love that we have to offer. Our love is based on and is motivated by God's standard, which is his word, the Bible. <clears throat> the scripture says God is love. And what love will look like in a Christian context is going to look different than it will in a secular context. If the world is on the outside looking in, what are they going to hopefully see? Well, the simplest, most concise definition that we have of love, of course, is in 1 Corinthians 13. And so I'd like us to turn there very quickly and just... We're going to blast through the, a few verses in 1 Corinthians 13 because if we're going to define love, and this is, of course, <clears throat> defining agape love, different Greek word for love than brotherly love, but nevertheless, we don't want to make that <clears throat> distinction too different because... Christian love is going to exemplify the love that is illustrated in 1 Corinthians chapter 13. And we're going to start reading at verse 4. Let's read through it real quickly and then I'll go back and just kind of zip through this and discuss briefly what each thing means. Verse 4 says, Love is patient. 
Love is kind and is not jealous. Love does not brag and is not arrogant. It does not act unbecomingly. It does not seek its own. It's not provoked. It does not take into account a wrong suffered. It does not rejoice in unrighteousness, but rejoices with the truth. It bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. So there's the summary. That's what love looks like. That's what it's gonna look like when we're exercising brotherly love. It's gonna, it's gonna bear these marks, okay? So going back to verse four, first of all, it says love is patient. <laughs> Don't you wish it hadn't said that? <laughs> patience. <clears throat> Lord, please give me patience in my heart, but do it quickly, Lord, please. <laughs> patience. Do we ever pray that way? Probably not, hopefully not. <clears throat> but that word there means to be of a long spirit, to not lose heart, to persevere patiently and bravely in enduring misfortunes and troubles, to be patient in bearing the offenses and injuries of others, to be mild and slow in avenging. We'll talk about that a little bit more later. But that's, in a nutshell, what it means. 1 Thessalonians 5.14 says, We urge you, brethren, admonish the unruly, encourage the faint-hearted, help the weak, and here it is, be patient with everyone. Everyone! So, number one, love is patient. Number two, love is kind. That word there means usefulness. Based upon what is appropriate. Usefulness based upon what is appropriate. Now, kindness can actually go hand in hand with patience because acts of kindness will be proof positive that patience is being demonstrated. And a perfect example of this is our own gracious Heavenly Father. Luke 6.35 says, Love your enemies and do good and lend, expecting nothing in return, and your reward will be great, and you will be sons of the Most High, for He Himself is kind to ungrateful and evil men. Amazing, isn't it? That that's the way He is. Ephesians 4.32 says, Be kind one to another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, just as God in Christ also has forgiven you. So true kindness is when I can pour myself out for the benefit of others, even when they mistreat me. Kindness. Now, following these two positive expressions of what love is, next we're gonna find seven verbs that, that express what love is not. Love is not jealous or does not envy. Interestingly, the word jealous here comes from a Greek word from which our English word zeal is derived. It means to burn with zeal. It means to be in zealous pursuit. When it's used negatively, it refers to the pursuit of something that someone else owns or has. Jealous or envy is wanting to have whatever someone else has because they seem to have more than we do or it seems like they have something we're missing out on. We often find this word in the New Testament being used in conjunction with the word strife, a word that is synonymously, or rather synonymous with jealousy and the word strife was actually used to denote the rivalry that existed over various teachers in 1 Corinthians chapter three. Remember Paul said to the Corinthians, you are yet carnal, for whereas there is among you envying and strife and divisions, he says, are you not carnal and walking as mere men? For while one says, I am of Paul and another I am of, of Apollos, are you not carnal, he said? The carnality being their envying and strife. If you want to see some additional insight on the sin of envy, you can read the passages in James chapter 3, verses 13 through 18, if you're taking notes. I'll let you read that on your own. James 3, 13 through 18. Next, it says here that love does not brag and is not arrogant. It does not brag and it is not 
arrogant. Now, the word for brag here means, and I'm just quoting from a lexicon, it means to praise oneself excessively. It means to use rhetorical embellishments to extol oneself. It also means to be a windbag. The term arrogant is also translated <clears throat> to be puffed up. It's very similar in meaning to the word brag in that the basis for both of them is pride. It perhaps, the word arrogant perhaps differs from bragging in as much as bragging denotes the expression of the feelings of pride or vanity. But a man may be very proud and vain and not actually express it in the form of bragging or boasting. If he ends up giving expression to that feeling, and ends up boasting of his endowments, well then, then that's indicated by the word brag. Love would destroy that feeling as well as the expression of it. Love would kill it in the heart and love would hopefully kill it from coming out of the mouth. The two together in this context suggests self-centered actions in which there is an, an inordinate desire to call attention to oneself. Children, little children especially, are so good at bringing attention to themselves. I mean, once you get a one-year-old to figure out you're paying attention to them because they're doing something, man, they're just gonna pour it on. And that's the, that's the, the form of pride. We think it's cute because they're repeating something maybe over and over again, but they're little selfish hearts, just full of sin, <laughs> just want attention. We have to obviously deal with that as parents. Now, the first two in the list in verse five are related to bragging and arrogance. <clears throat> and notice what it says here in verse five, that love related to bragging and arrogance, verse five says, number one, love does not act becomingly. And let's just hit the next one too. It does not seek its own. Love does not act unbecomingly. King James says, love doth not behave itself unseemly. Unbecomingly means to behave disgracefully, dishonorably, and indecently. It means to act in defiance of social and moral standards with resulting disgrace, embarrassment, and shame. The term is used in 1 Corinthians 7.36 where it says, but if any man thinks that he behaves himself uncomingly, or uncomely, excuse me, toward his virgin. So there we can see that there's, there's moral overtones there. In 1 Corinthians chapter 11, it says that they acted unbecomingly towards certain brethren during the Lord's Supper. So the idea here is that love is very concerned for what is fitting, and then this leads to the next thing, love doesn't seek its own. Now that's important because we live in a society that is consumed with self. We're training a generation of children to think more highly of themselves. Our preoccupation with self extends to practically every facet of American life as we know it. And then the Bible comes along and says, love doesn't seek its own. In some ways, this is the fullest expression of what Christian love is all about. It does not seek its own. It does not believe that finding oneself is the highest good. It is not enamored with self-gain or self-justification or self-worth. To the contrary, it seeks the good of one's neighbor or even one's enemy. Love doesn't seek its own. Look what it says next. Next it says that love is not provoked. Now the King James says that love is not easily provoked. The word easily was supplied by the translators. It's not in the original, but the sense is there. That's the sense of what this is saying. The word for provoked here means to be irritated. It means to be touchy. It means to become excited to indignation or wrath. 
The meaning of the phrase in the Greek is that a man who is under the influence of love is not prone to violent anger or exasperation. It is not his character to be hasty, to be excited in a hasty way. Love, one writer wrote, <clears throat> does not become exasperated into indignation partly because patience delays exasperation and partly because lack of self-interest diverts, diverts a sense of self-importance away from reacting on the grounds of wounded pride. It is not embittered by injuries, whether real or supposed. That's interesting. We know this verse, James 1.19, this you know, my beloved brethren, but everyone must be quick to hear, slow to speak, slow to anger, for the wrath of man does not achieve the righteousness of God. Amen? Also, it says in verse five, love does not take into account a wrong suffered. King James renders this, love thinks, thinketh, thinketh. Gotta add that eth on the end. Love thinketh no evil. And there's nothing wrong about the, the rendering in there in the King James because essentially <clears throat> this taking into account is something that takes place in the mind. It starts in the thought life. Now this is actually a very powerful and, funda and fundamental for a believer because it deals with the thought life. He doesn't take into account, he thinks no evil. And that term there, thinking, or excuse me, <laughs> taking into account actually comes from a single Greek word <clears throat> which is an accounting term. And the word literally means to count, to compute, to calculate, to count up, or to weigh the reasons, to deliberate, to deliberate, or to consider. So here, as an attribute of love, it means that to keep a mental record of events for the sake of some future action, it means to add up in one's mind or to make a list in one's heart. That's the idea here. Love doesn't do that in an evil way. In other words, love doesn't keep a record to return evil for evil. It's not adding things up. Remember when Jesus taught on forgiveness and said, forgive, and Peter said, how many times shall I forgive? Seven? And Jesus basically said, don't count. Peter thought he probably thought he was being generous by saying seven. That's a lot for me to, to forgive someone, to overlook someone's offense seven times. I mean, come on, Lord, that's seven times seems like enough. And Jesus said, no, it's actually, well, 490 if you add up what he said, 70 times seven. How often is love quenched in my heart and mind because I'm keeping a calculated ledger of all the times that someone has injured me? Or how often are Christian communities stifled in spiritual growth because people are consumed with thoughts of the past of how they've been hurt by someone and they just can't move on? Here it's indicating the one who loves does not take notice of the evil done to them. No records are kept. The slate is kept clean. Proverbs 10, 12 says that hatred stirs up strife, but love covers all transgressions. That's just what it does. God forgives us over and over and over and over again. Every time we ask, he forgives. Next, verse 6. Love does not rejoice in unrighteousness, but it rejoices with the truth. In other words, love finds <clears throat> pleasure in virtue and what is good. Thus, it does not delight in evil. Now, on the contrary, the wicked, Proverbs 2.14 says, delight in doing wrong and rejoice in the perverseness of evil. Love doesn't bless evil. Back in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, love does not bless incest. Back in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, love does not, <clears throat> love 
is against selfish lawsuits. Love does not bless sexual immorality, also in 1 Corinthians chapter 6. Love doesn't bless that. Two people that are in fornicating with one another can't say, I love you. No, you don't. Not if you're fornicating. You don't love. It's not what love does. Love doesn't rejoice in that. Those who give themselves over to evil bestow their approval on those who do what is wrong. The righteous one, however, it says here, rejoices with the truth. Love takes delight when righteousness flourishes and advances. Think about Isaiah 5.20. Woe to those who call evil good and good evil who substitute darkness for light and light for darkness, who substitute bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. Psalm 97.10 says, Hate evil, you who love the Lord. Psalm 119.104 says, From your precept I get understanding, therefore I hate every false way. That's love for you. Hates evil, loves good. Lastly, verse 7, and this sort of just summarizes things. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endure, endures all things. This is interesting because love trusts that the motives of action are pure. Love hopes that the motives of actions are pure. Love has the capacity to endure despite the ingratitude, the bad conduct, and the problems that all communal living involves, and this without complaining or becoming discouraged. Things just bounce right off love. When the motives actually do prove to be impure, then love bears with it with no resentment. Love bears, endures, it puts up with a lot it does not forsake people when life is hard and one's energy is taxed. Oh, this person, I'm just up to here with them. My patience is so tried. And so here we have in 1 Corinthians 4 through 7, a good summary of what Philadelphia is going to look like. There's the picture. Turn on back to Hebrews. So, the bar is very, very high. The love bar, right? The standard is high. Christian love draws a line in the sand. Biblical love refuses to be a counterpart to the world's standard of love. Christian love is shaped by what we just read in 1 Corinthians 13. That's what Christian love looks like. Humanistic or non-theistic attempts to exhibit love fall short. Humanistic love is always self-centered. It's always inconsistent. It's the opposite of what we just read. It will always miss the mark. It will never serve God's purpose. And so consequently, Christians should never take their cues about love from the unbelieving world. Christians don't stand in solidarity with their worldview. We don't adopt their views on, on parenting, on how to have a good marriage, on how to be a good employee, on how to be a good citizen. We're not even in full agreement on issues related to science and medicine. The biblical worldview on life makes Christians a very peculiar kind of people. Right now, here in the United States of America, we are experiencing a clash, a major clash of worldviews. What the secular pop culture wants for everyone to see they want the world to, the whole world to see everything through their eyes and line up on their side. And they're very militant about it. 
Christians cannot view the world through the same lens that the unsaved world views the world through. We take our marching orders from God. Everybody knows about the major event that took place last month where one image bearer of God lost his life because of the sinful act of another image bearer of God and this created an explosion of emotion, one for which our country is still reeling over the effects of it. The secular culture has responded with all of the energy that they can muster to try and solve what they perceive as the problem. Even some well-meaning Christians will join in with their ranks in an attempt to rectify the problem the world's way. But their efforts will be in vain unless people are told that they need to turn to God and they need to be given new hearts by converting to Christ Jesus. The great social evils that exist in our country have no lasting solution apart from things that are connected to Christ Jesus. There's no solution for the world that doesn't involve conversion to Christ. All the solutions will be superficial. And what we're seeing in our culture today is the blind trying to lead the blind. Now, one of the great dangers for the church, and Pastor Byron pointed this out a few weeks ago, is the division that all of this tension in the culture can create within the body of Christ. As the body of Christ is trying to assess everything and kind of take it all in and sort out, you know, well, what's true in this and what's false in this, this can cause conflict. This can create a disruption in our brotherly love. Well, there's only one side that the believer should take as we are working through these trying times that are upon us all, and it's always God's side. <clears throat> you notice there's a lot of catchphrases and buzzwords that are flying around today on the internet or even in conversation. A use of certain terms, there are certain terms that people use as identifying markers. And sometimes those terms can be used to polarize people. Or sometimes they're even used in a weaponized way to invoke an emotional reaction. When I was younger, one of the hot button things to say was, and I hope nobody takes offense at this, but your mama, your mother, I mean, man, oh man. That's all you had to say to someone to move the conversation to the next level. I mean, that was the purpose of it. The purpose, of, and that was, people took great offense. If you said, you talking about my mother? You talking about my mother, right? And man, boom, that would be it right there. Fists were about to fly. Why? Well, because words have meaning. Sticks and stones may break my bones, but names will never hurt me, we used to hear said. But that's not true. Names do hurt. Names are oftentimes meant to injure. So words have meaning. But it's always best for Christians to try to stay out of meaningless word wars and try to limit ourselves to biblical terms. Think about some of the buzzwords in the culture today. <clears throat> I'll give you a few of them. Ready? Here's a, here's a list of some, some hot button ones. Some of them are not so much hot buttons. <clears throat> they're, just, they're just words that, that definitely invoke a response. Bigotry. Prejudice. Homophobic. Hater. It's a good one. Triggered. Safe space, that's a gentle one. Safe space, social injustice, virtue signaling, intersectionality. Some of you may not even know what that means. Racist. Black lives matter. Critical race theory. Liberal left, 
right winger. Well, that's just a few. I could probably name 25 more. But those words mean something in our culture today. Maybe someday I'll do a teaching on contemporary buzzwords and offer some biblical reflection on their meaning. I'm not going to do that today. My main point in mentioning all of this is simply to say that the only hill for a Christian to die on are the hills that are established in the word of God and the ones that God says this is a hill to die on. And one of those hills that we are commanded to die on is we are to be devoted to maintaining brotherly love. That is a hill that Christians are to die on. And if something is going to be thrown into the, into the mix to disrupt that love, then it would have to be something that the word of God says, no, this is not something to unite on, this is something to, to divide over. Could be a sin issue. Paul dealt with that in 1 Corinthians chapter 5. Remember, they were the rejoicing over something in the community that Paul said, not even the world accepts this within their ranks. Deal with it. Kick that person out, is what he said. <clears throat> so we have to understand that the outside world is looking in, and by this shall all men know you're my disciples, by the love that you have one for another. But brothers and sisters, that is a very particular kind of love because it's a love <clears throat> that is generated by the Holy Spirit in our hearts. Well, that was the introduction. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> number two, number two. Let me, I'll, I'll make these next two much quicker. Number two, brotherly love must be maintained. It is important because, number two, it reveals our true identity to ourselves. It reveals our true identity to ourselves. Loving fellow Christians reveals our true identity to ourselves. It gives added assurance to us of our spiritual life in Christ. Let me show that to you. First John chapter 3. You can turn there real quick. First John chapter 3. <clears throat> Just two verses. First John chapter 3. And actually, there's a number of verses in 1 John that deal with this. 1 John 3, verse 13. First of all, it says, Do not be surprised, brethren, if the world hates you. Even if you love each other, the world may still hate you. Okay? We know that we have passed out of life, or excuse me, out of death into life because we love God the brethren. He who does not love abides in death. Very specifically, that's referring to a love that we now have for those who are in Christ. You see, a sure proof of salvation is found in our own hearts. It is our love for each other. If we wonder about our salvation, we can ask do I have a great concern for the welfare of the Christians that I know? Do I enjoy their fellowship? Do I want to assemble with them? Do I show my concern by ministering to their needs? Do I love to talk about the things of the word with other Christians? If the answer is yes, then we have no better evidence than, than we are child children of God, because we love his other children, our brothers and sisters in Christ. That's one of the fruit of being born again. I love the body of Christ. I love righteous people. One of the qualifications of an elder, a lover of good men. 1 John 2.10 2, says the one who loves his brother, abides in the light, and there's no cause for stumbling in him. 1 John 4.20 says, if someone says, I love God and hates his brother, he is a liar. For the one who does not love his brother whom he has seen cannot love God whom he has not seen. And this commandment we have from him that the one who loves God should love his brother also. First John lays that out there as a sign 
of whether or not you're in Christ. Want to know if you're in Christ? You love the brothers, the brotherhood. So that's number two. Number two, it reveals our true identity to ourselves. And number three, the reason why brotherly love is so important, and you would have thought I would have started with this one, but I didn't. Number three, because it delights God. Brotherly love must continue because it delights God. Nothing is more pleasing to parents than to see their children caring for each other. Think about Psalm 133, verse 1. Behold how good and how pleasant it is for brothers to dwell together in unity. It is like the precious oil upon the head coming down upon the beard, even Aaron's beard coming down upon the edges, the edge of his robes. It is like the dew of Hermon, Mount Hermon, coming down from the mountains of Zion, for there the Lord commanded the blessing, life forever. How good and how pleasant it is for the brethren to dwell together in unity. When his children care for each other, when they help each other, when they live in harmony with each other, God is both delighted and God is glorified. When we love each other to the, to the degree that we are willing to give our lives for one another, we exemplify God's own son. 1 John 3, 16, we know love by this, that he laid down his life for us and we ought to, to lay down our lives for the brethren. New Testament brotherly love is not simply sentimental. It is not superficial affection. It is affection built on deep and concerning concern and is characterized by practical commitment. Galatians 6, 9 says, let us not lose heart in doing good, for in due time we will reap if we do not grow weary. So then, while we have opportunity, let us do good to all people, and especially to those who are of the household of the faith. Now, one of the obvious causes of lovelessness among Christians is sin. Jesus predicted, because lawlessness is increased, most people's love will grow cold, Matthew 24, 12 says. And nothing cools love as fast as sin, especially that of lacking brotherly love. The temperature of the culture today is perfect for causing the fruit of Christians to shrivel up in this area. When the church begins to champion the causes of the secular culture and adopt their attitudes, you can be sure that love for Christ and his church is going to die. When we choose not to love each other because the world is fighting over something, they're fighting on a hill that they want to die on, that we shouldn't die on, and we end up fighting their cause with you amongst each other, we are sinning against God when we don't choose God's hill to die on alone. We're sinning against God. Romans 12, 10 says, be devoted to one another in brotherly love, giving preference to one another in honor. 1 Peter 2, 17 says, honor all people, love the brotherhood, the brethren. Fear God, honor the king. Jesus in his high priestly prayer said in John 17, 9, I ask this prayer on their behalf, his disciples. I do not ask on behalf of the world, but of those whom you've given me, for they are yours. That's who that prayer was for, and for anyone who would believe after them. That's who that prayer was for, the brethren. Jesus said, I do not ask on behalf of these alone, but for those who also will believe in me through their word, that they all may be one, even as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they also may be in us, so that the world may believe that you sent me. Quoted that earlier. So brotherly love must be maintained. Now, 
Coming up are two examples or several examples of how we can show brotherly love. (laughs) And I actually thought we were going to get to it today, but we are not going to get to it today. So I'm going to go ahead and just put a period right there. And next week, Lord willing, we'll talk about showing hospitality to strangers and we'll talk about ministering to those who are incarcerated or for those who are being afflicted. I did not know I would go this long in the subject. I apologize. Well, I don't really apologize, but I don't need to apologize. But I was hoping to cover more ground, but hopefully we covered enough ground. So let us remember that brotherly love my brothers and sisters in Christ, is something that Christians need to fight for, maintain, embrace, exercise. And remember 1 Corinthians 13, 4 through 7. What love is going to look like? What's that going to look like in our midst? What's that going to look like in our hearts? How is that going to be implemented in our daily lives toward one another. Amen? Let's stand. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you so loved the world. You are our supreme example of love. You are the embodiment of love. You show us how love is to be exhibited. How dare that we try to alter what that looks like. Lord, our version of love that is derived, that comes from our own sinful nature is a counterfeit of the real thing. It's fake. And so, Lord, help us to pick up the mantle of your love and to wear it, to lay that yoke upon us and to bear that yoke that's easy and that burden that is light because it's so freeing to love the way you've commanded us to love. It may be death to self, but it is life everlasting. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. God bless you guys. Lord willing, see you Wednesday. Test one, two, am I still on?